The narrative of the encounter between the Jewish King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba is a recurring theme across all Abrahamic faiths. The Queen of Sheba's legacy extends across medieval, Renaissance, and modern literature and art, reflecting her enduring influence and mystical allure. Initially not widely depicted until the 12th century, she became a significant symbol in Christian iconography. Gothic and Romanesque cathedrals throughout Europe featured her image in sculptures and stained glass. During the Renaissance, her reception became a popular subject, portrayed by artists like Lorenzo Ghiberti and Benozzo Gozzoli, and writers like Boccaccio and Christine de Pizan highlighted her wisdom and regal status. An intriguing account often depicted in various artistic renditions is the meeting between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. In its most elaborated form, the tale suggests a union between the two monarchs, resulting in the birth of a son named Baina Lekem. This male child is also called Menelik I, bearing the name David, in honor of his grandfather. Menelik I is celebrated for establishing the Solomonic dynasty in Ethiopia, a lineage that concluded with Emperor Haile Selassie, who passed away in 1975. While religious texts provide a foundation for this story, it is crucial to explore the historical evidence that might support the alleged union between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. This investigation is a fascinating journey that encourages you to delve deeper into the historical context, sparking a sense of curiosity and motivation. To gain a comprehensive understanding of these steps, you are encouraged to watch our recent video about the role of Ethiopia in the founding of Christianity. In the Hebrew Bible, the Queen of Sheba visits King Solomon to test his wisdom with riddles, bringing a lavish caravan of spices, gold, and precious stones. Solomon impresses her with his answers, and they exchange gifts before she returns to her land. This account emphasizes the wealth and wisdom associated with both figures and suggests diplomatic and trade connections between their kingdoms. In Christian texts, the Queen of Sheba is referred to as the Queen of the South. She visits Solomon to hear his wisdom, a story that parallels her biblical visit. This encounter is also mentioned in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, linking her story to Christian themes of seeking wisdom. Coptic stories portray the Queen of Sheba's encounter with Solomon as one of both wisdom and mystique, involving exchanges of significant artifacts and questions of great depth. In Ethiopian tradition, particularly within the Kebra Nagast, the Queen of Sheba has a son with Solomon named Menelik I, who later brings the Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia. This legend is foundational to the Solomonic dynasty's claim to rule and features elaborate tales of divine favor and prophetic destiny linking Ethiopia with ancient Israelite history. The Quranic account names her as Bilkis and describes her ruling a prosperous kingdom that initially worships the sun. Solomon invites her to worship God, leading to her conversion after witnessing miracles and Solomon's wisdom. In Yoruba culture, she is known as Bilikisu Sangbo and associated with the Eredo Monument in Nigeria. Local lore suggests she was a noble woman who significantly impacted the region, and archaeological interest in the Eredo lends some historical weight to these claims, though it remains a subject of debate. These narratives show the Queen of Sheba as a figure of wealth, wisdom, and spiritual intrigue, woven into the fabric of multiple cultures and religions, each adding layers to her legendary status. The tale of King Solomon and his association with the Queen of Sheba is set in the 10th century BC, a period marked by complex geopolitical dynamics in the region. The Kingdom of Sheba, located in the southern Arabian Peninsula, modern-day Yemen, was a significant state with a deep-rooted African identity, believed to have been established by Nubian settlers from present-day Sudan. This kingdom exhibited traditional African societal structures such as matriarchy and priest kings, and it worshipped a single deity represented by the sun, encompassing multiple male and female aspects. The kingdom of Sheba also extended into what are now Eritrea and Ethiopia. The remnants of Sheba in Marib, Yemen, showcase ancient temples and Sabaean script, evidencing a highly developed civilization. According to African-American historian Runoko Rashidi, in the book Millennial History of Africans in Asia, 
The kingdom was not only prosperous, but also notable for the prominent roles women frequently played within its society. Historically referred to as Arabia Felix, or Fortunate Arabia, by the Greeks and Romans, Sheba was renowned for its wealth, perfumes, and riches, as noted by Pliny the Elder. The kingdom's matriarchal system inherently positioned women, particularly the king's mother, at the center of governance. Sheba was a prosperous, matriarchal kingdom spanning two continents, predominantly led by women. The biblical portrayal of King Solomon is filled with depictions of his extraordinary wealth, grand palaces, and global renown for wisdom, suggesting he was one of history's richest and most powerful rulers. Recent archaeological research, including a study from the journal PLOS One, has provided new evidence that may support the historical existence of the biblical kingdoms of David and Solomon. Using radiocarbon dating of materials from the ancient city of Gezer in central Israel, researchers have dated structures like gates, walls, and a large administrative building to the early 10th century BC, aligning with the era traditionally associated with King Solomon's reign. This study and others like it have sparked debate over the accuracy of biblical narratives. As the biblical texts were written centuries after the events they describe and are subject to historical scrutiny. Contrarily, other evidence suggests that what was believed to be remnants of Solomon and David's time may actually date from a century later, challenging the timeline established by the Bible. The discovery at Giza and other nearby sites has reignited discussions on the historicity of a unified monarchy under David and Solomon. However, critics like Professor Israel Finkelstein argue that such archaeological evidence is insufficient to definitively attribute these ancient structures to specific biblical figures due to the limitations of radiocarbon dating, which can only exclude dates but not specify builders. Scholars like Israel Finkelstein, director of the Institute of Archaeology at Tel Aviv University, and Neil Arsha Silberman of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, describe Solomon and his father David as mere tribal chieftains with limited regional influence over their mountainous territories. Moreover, Despite biblical claims of Solomon's widespread fame and the visits of foreign dignitaries, contemporary records from other regions do not mention him or his kingdom. This absence suggests he was not widely known outside his immediate locale. Amihai Mazar, another archaeologist from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, critiques the biblical exaggerations of Solomon's kingdom's size and wealth, pointing out the improbability of his supposed 1,000 wives especially given the small population of Jerusalem at the time. Echoing these sentiments, historian Sheikh Anta Diop characterizes Solomon as a minor monarch, ruling over just a small piece of land, starkly contrasting with the legendary accounts of his global dominion. How is it that on one hand we have a queen reigning over a prosperous kingdom spanning two continents, while on the other we encounter an ostensibly insignificant leader of just a mountain encampment? Is this scientific narrative accurate? In the biblical narrative found in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1 to 29, the Queen of Sheba visits King Solomon, prompted by his burgeoning reputation for unparalleled wisdom. This passage vividly describes her approach to testing Solomon's wisdom through riddles and her astonishment at his court's opulence, his insightful responses, and the overall splendor of his reign. Overwhelmed, she acknowledges that the reports of his wisdom and wealth she had heard were indeed not exaggerated. The queen then gifts Solomon with lavish presents, including gold, spices, and precious stones, after which Solomon reciprocates generously, further underscoring his prosperity and magnanimity. This exchange culminates in her return to her own country, enriched by the experience. However, the historicity of this account is widely debated among scholars. Critics like Israel Finkelstein and Neil Arsha Silberman argue that this narrative serves a specific socio-political agenda. Written during a time when the Jewish people faced subjugation and lacked a cohesive national identity, the biblical stories aim to forge a unified history and inspire hope among the people. Solomon's depiction as a grand monarch and his interaction with the Queen of Sheba, a known and significant figure, were likely embellished or even fabricated to elevate his status and, by extension, that of the Jewish nation. This narrative construction was intended to embed a sense of a distinguished past and divine favor, essential for sustaining morale and a collective identity under foreign domination. 
The strategic use of Solomon's story, including his encounter with the Queen of Sheba, was to assert the importance and legitimacy of Judah in the context of the lucrative Arabian trade routes of the 7th century BCE. This period, marked by anachronisms in the narrative, reflects the writer's intent to align their contemporary socio-economic aspirations with a glorified historical framework. Moreover, it's important to note that while the Bible refrains from suggesting a romantic liaison between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba leading to offspring, such an idea finds a place in other traditions, notably in Islamic texts and Ethiopian lore, which suggest that their meeting had lasting implications, including progeny. This divergence in accounts highlights how narratives are adapted and expanded in different cultural and religious contexts to serve varying historical, theological, and cultural needs. This analysis underscores not just the what and how of the biblical narrative and its scholarly critique, but also the why, the deeper implications of storytelling in shaping cultural identity and historical consciousness. Surah 27 of the Quran relates a story about Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. It begins with a bird informing Solomon about Sheba, where a woman rules over a land rich in resources and possessing a grand throne. However, the queen and her people worship the sun rather than Allah, led astray by Satan's deceptions. Allah is declared as the sole deity, the Lord of the immense throne. Solomon sends the bird back with a message for the queen, urging humility and submission to Allah. The queen receives Solomon's message with respect and consults her advisors, recognizing the letter's nobility. When the queen travels to meet Solomon, he tricks her into thinking her throne is present to test her. Acknowledging his wisdom and realizing her past idolatry, the queen declares, I have wronged myself. I submit with Solomon to Allah, the Lord of the universe, thus embracing monotheism. The Quranic text was standardized under the orders of Caliph Uthman, who is said to have eliminated other versions to unify the Islamic text. This narrative adaptation from the Bible known in the region due to earlier Roman and Christian influences, serve to affirm the Islamic principle that there is no God but Allah. The story's inclusion and adaptation were likely influenced by the need to supplant pre-existing local beliefs, including the African spirituality of the Sabaeans, with the monotheistic patriarchal structure of Islam. This transformation is portrayed through the demonization of the Queen of Sheba's indigenous beliefs and her subsequent conversion to Islam, aligning historically disparate narratives to serve the theological and cultural objectives of early Islam. In 330 AD, during the reign of King Azana, Christian Romanized merchants established in the Pharaonic kingdom of Aksum in present-day Ethiopia played a pivotal role in converting the king to Christianity. This marked the beginning of the Christianization of the region. King Azana, embracing his new faith zealously, waged wars against the animist vitalists and dismantled the pharaonic civilization of the Barwa Empire, Mero, in Sudan, branding it as pagan. The term Ethiopia, derived from the Greek Ethiopius, meaning burnt face, and indicative of a black complexion, initially referred to Sudan and then broadly to Africa. It was King Azana who first used this term to describe the kingdom of Aksum. Under his rule, Aksum expanded its influence, even exerting control over parts of southern Arabia, reminiscent of the empire of his legendary ancestor, Sheba. The geopolitical interactions between Ethiopia and the Islamized regions of Arabia introduced the Quran to the Ethiopians. Despite their deep engagement with Christian teachings, Ethiopians grappled with the realization that the biblical promises made to the Jews did not pertain to them, highlighting a dissonance between their adopted faith and their own cultural identity. This spiritual and identity crisis prompted the Ethiopian Christians in the 14th century to forge a new path by creating their own sacred text, the Kebra Nagast, thereby weaving together their historical connections to the Sabaeans, the teachings of the Bible, and the Quran. This text was an attempt to reconcile their rich heritage with the spiritual narratives inherited from Judaism and Christianity affirming their unique place in the religious and cultural history of the region. After being profoundly moved by Solomon's wisdom, the Queen of Sheba declared, from this moment forward, I will forsake sun worship 
to follow the God of Israel, the creator of the sun. When it came time for her departure, after a six month stay, Solomon marveled at her beauty and pondered the possibility of having descendants with her, wishing that any progeny might vanquish idolaters and expand his realm. One night, as the queen wandered the palace seeking water, she encountered Solomon. He allowed her to quench her thirst, and subsequently, they shared a night together. As the queen prepared to return to her homeland, Solomon expressed a hope that if she bore a son, the child should come to him. He dreamt of a son rising over Israel and reaching Ethiopia, symbolizing his influence and lineage. Nine months and five days after their parting, the queen gave birth to a son, Bina Lechem. When he matured, he resolved to meet his father. Upon their reunion, Solomon and his counselors decided to crown Bina Lechem as king of Ethiopia, thus founding the Solomonic dynasty there. This narrative, encapsulated in the Kebra Nagast, represents the crafting of a legend from historical fragments spanning from the 7th century BC to the 14th century. In this elaborated tale, Solomon speaks of Ethiopia, a name not assigned to the region until the 4th century, highlighting anachronisms in the story. Through the Kebra Nagast, Ethiopians crafted a narrative of Jewish roots, allowing them to peacefully integrate their faith. Meanwhile, historian Shlomo Sand notes that the Falasha, or Ethiopian Jews, were likely converted by Jewish missionaries, rather than descending directly from ancient Israelites. The absence of concrete archaeological evidence concerning the existence of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba raises intriguing questions about where we might seek further clues. Given the historical and geographical context of the biblical narratives, one potential avenue for exploration is ancient Kemet, or Egypt. This civilization had extensive interactions with neighboring regions, including the areas traditionally associated with Solomon and Sheba. Exploring Egyptian records, artifacts, and sites might yield new insights or corroborate existing theories. Additionally, examining the cultural and trade exchanges between Egypt and the kingdoms of Israel and Sheba could provide a broader understanding of these figures and their historical contexts. This approach not only broadens the scope of investigation, but also enriches our comprehension of the interconnectedness of ancient civilizations. Finally, do you believe in this tale of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon as depicted by revealed religions? I am interested in reviewing arguments for and against this tale. Thanks to all of our subscribers and channel members, Nubian storytellers. Be black and proud. Until the lions have their own historians, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter.